and welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. I'm Amber Smart, originally from Kenosha, Wisconsin. I'm a sophomore studying human resources in the School of Business. I am pleased to introduce Wisconsin Public Radio Morning Classics host, Stephanie Elkins. Today, Stephanie will be sharing with us the story of American composer Florence Price. Price is noticed as the first black woman to be recognized as a symphonic composer and the first to have a composition played by a major orchestra. We will be hearing Stephanie's account of Price's early life as a child prodigy, career as a composer, and the revival of Price's works, illustrated with several musical excerpts. In addition to the numerous hats she, hats she has worn since starting at Wisconsin Public Radio in 2007, Stephanie hosted Simply Folk from 2011 to 2016, co-hosted The Midday with Norman Gillen from 2008 to 2010, produced, produced music from Wisconsin, and has served as WPR's marketing director. She has conducted hundreds of interviews with musicians and genres ranging from opera to Americana. Please welcome Stephanie Elkins. Thank you so much, Amber, for that wonderful introduction. And many thanks to all of you who are joining today. If you're a WPR listener, we're so grateful for that. And thanks especially for your interest in Florence Price. She has been a trailblazer in so many ways. It's a fascinating, inspiring story. And her music is so beautifully crafted. It's uh, very appealing. So I think we're gonna have a, an interesting time together. Thanks also to the Badger Talks program. I'm so grateful for this opportunity to share a little bit about Florence Price with you. So we'll go mostly in chronological order. We're gonna start with her early life and her education and early career, her personal life, her time in Chicago when she really flourished and then the discovery of a trove of her music in 2009 and her legacy. And of course, we're gonna to listen to music throughout from piano to symphonic and vocal. And hopefully there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. You can ask me questions about her, about WPR, about myself, and you can put those questions anytime into the chat and we'll go over those afterwards. Uh, first, I have a confession and two caveats. I've been a classical radio host since 1995, an avid listener since I was really young. And I knew some of her piano pieces, but really did not become aware of the breadth and depth of her music until just a few years ago. It's easy to think of her music somehow as being rediscovered, but really it's been performed and appreciated both during her lifetime and after her death uh, to the present. My eyes happen to be opened by a new recording that we received at WPR, but there have been plenty of older recordings and lots of scholarly research and dissertations, things like that, mostly by black scholars and black musicians. So we're not talking about a musician who disappeared, but more about the mainstream classical world finally embracing a composer who was marginalized. And the second caveat is that I am not a musicologist. I'm not a historian. I am just a passionately curious appreciator. So I'll do my best to share what I have learned about Florence Price with you. So before we really delve in, uh, let's listen to some music. We're gonna hear an excerpt from Price's 1932 suite. It's called Ethiopia's Shadow in America. It has three movements and here are her notes for those. First, the arrival of the Negro in America when first brought here as a slave. Second, his resignation and faith. And third, his adaptation. And we're gonna hear a short excerpt from the middle movement called Resignation and Faith. This is the BBC Orchestra of Wales. And Anthony, you can roll that anytime.
Isn't that gorgeous? That literally put me in tears a couple of weeks ago when I was uh, auditioning that. And it's kind of sad. She wrote that in 1932, but it was not heard until 2015. So uh, Florence was born, Florence Beatrice Smith, on April 9th in 1887. And she was born in Little Rock. And her father was born in Delaware to free parents. He became a dentist and he built a practice in Chicago on the loop, but his office burned down in the great fire of 1871 and he relocated to Arkansas. Little Rock at that time was very welcoming for black Americans. There was a rich cultural life, social life, mixed neighborhoods. And so her father really thrived. He was also an artist. He exhibited his work. He was an author. He wrote a novel. And Florence's mother grew up in Indianapolis and she was a teacher and a musician and somewhat of an entrepreneur. She bought and sold real estate and she even opened a restaurant, ran a restaurant for a little while. And she was Florence's first music teacher and she must have gotten her started pretty early because Florence's first recital was given at age four. So the Smith family hosted many Black artists and musicians in their Little Rock home over the years, including Frederick Douglass, who was 73 when he visited. Uh, he, and there was a popular pianist at the time named Blind Boone who stopped by. And the composer William Grant Still, later known as the Dean of African American Composers. He grew up in the same Little Rock neighborhood as Florence did. They knew each other. He was a few years younger. She was quite the prodigy. She was really gifted intellectually and musically, so much so that she graduated from high school at age 14. This was just before her 15th birthday. birthday. And she was the valedictorian. She headed north for college the following year. She went left the South and went to study in Boston at the New England Conservatory of Music, She's 16 years old. And evidently she listed her hometown as being in Mexico on some materials there. And it seems that was trying to avoid discrimination. Her talent spoke for itself though, and she really excelled at the conservatory. And that's where she became interested in serious composition. In fact, she was one of the very few chosen to study with the director of the conservatory. That was George Whitefield Chadwick. And she graduated at age 19 with a double degree, organ performance and piano pedagogy. And that is her graduating class. You can barely see, but there's a little white circle. And that is Florence, Florence Smith at that time. So George Whitefield Chadwick, her composition teacher, was really important in her development. He encouraged her to begin incorporating African-American melodies and rhythms into her work. And one of the themes that she came back to many times is the Juba dance. And that's a particular rhythmic pattern that originated in Western Africa. It was brought here and adapted by enslaved people working on plantations. And we're gonna hear two examples of Price's Juba music. And the first one is the third movement from her string quartet in A minor. And she called this the Juba movement. And Anthony, you can hit that anytime. Thank you. 
Isn't that neat music? And that was an ensemble called Castle of Our Skins. They're dedicated to celebrating Black artistry through music. And another example of a Juba dance in her music is found in her first symphony. And again, it's the name of the third movement. You know, she would say Allegro or Andante, the formal names of movements, and then it would be Juba movement. So we'll hear this beginning of the Juba movement from her first symphony. That was the Fort Smith Symphony led by John Jeter. And in both of you, those, you can hear the syncopation and the pentatonic scale, some of those blues chord progressions, even in the first one, a really interesting, appealing music. Well, when Florence Price graduated in 1906, she was barely 19 now. She headed back to Arkansas from Boston and got her first teaching job at the Cotton Plant Arkadelphia Academy. And that was followed by a faculty position at Shorter College in North Little Rock. Both of those, by the way, were segregated institutions. And that image on the right is of Shorter College students from that era. And then in 1910, her dad died and her mom sold the family home and returned to her roots in Indianapolis. And Florence moved to Atlanta and she was offered a position at what's now Clark Atlanta University, a historically black college. In fact, she was the chair of the music department there through 1912 as a female in her 20s. So she was already breaking barriers and she would continue to do so. In 1912, Florence Smith headed back to Little Rock and she married a lawyer named Thomas Price. And she also resumed teaching at Shorter College for a little while. And they had a young son and two daughters, but their son died at an early age. Florence kept busy. She had a successful piano and violin teaching studio from their home, and she continued to compose mostly studies and exercises for her students. And she was able to publish some of her work, which was also a source of income. In 19 17, the Arkansas State Music Teachers Association was founded, and so she applied for membership. She was turned down due to her race. So she founded the Little Rock Club of Musicians, which was a professional organization for Black musicians. Even before Florence had left for Boston, that nice situation for Blacks in Little Rock had been changing. Jim Crow laws were passed and her father, who had once had a successful mixed dental practice, lost all of his white patients. And when she returned from school, it was even worse. And then it got really ugly. There were lynchings, there were riots, and her husband was a prominent lawyer who represented some of those who were unjustly accused. And there was one particularly horrific event that served as a catalyst for the prices. It was the lynching of a man named John Carter, 1927, near Thomas's law office. And Carter's body was dragged behind a car through the black parts of town. And then the mob set his body on fire in front of the largest black church in the city. 
And so the prices, excuse me, not, <clears throat> it's a little overwhelming. They decided to leave Arkansas and they became part of the great migration north. And in their case, they went to Chicago. And keep in mind, this is a time of great flowering of black culture elsewhere. The Harlem Renaissance was underway and there was a similar creative culture on the south side of Chicago. But shortly before they left, during this time of violence and lynchings, Florence Price entered a composition contest for Blacks, and she won with a piano piece called In the Land of Cotton. And you can almost feel her soul in this excerpt. It's played by Dr. Karen Walwyn, who makes a couple of incisive comments as well. Anthony, that one's ready to go. This movement is probably the most soulful in a darker way. Um, I can imagine this being sung in a Baptist, Southern Baptist church. Isn't that um, just amazing, moving music? And by the way, if you have questions or comments about the music, uh, just put those in the chat as I'm going through this, and we'll take those at the end. So once in Chicago, Florence Price really came alive, but her marriage was on the rocks. Thomas Price's law practice was not doing well, and there were accounts of serious physical abuse on his part. They divorced in 1928, and that documentation refers to two instances in which he threatened to kill her and several in which he hit her face with his fist. So she uh, had the wherewithal to divorce him and then she had to work hard to cobble together a living. She got some more of her piano pieces published and she wrote some pop type music under a pseudonym and she played the organ for silent films and she taught, taught piano and violin and she was also a voracious lifelong learner. And in Chicago, she had a great environment to do that. She attended the American Conservatory of Music on scholarship, and she did additional study at the Chicago Teachers College and the University of Chicago, including languages. And she also studied more composition and orchestration at what's now the Chicago College of Performing Arts of Roosevelt University. The vibrant artistic climate there really nurtured her intellect and her creativity. And she met and made friends with kindred spirits. And one of those was the dancer and choreographer, Catherine Dunham, who staged a ballet inspired by Price's Fantasy Negre or Negro Fantasy. And that music is based on a spiritual called Sinner, Please Don't Let This Harvest Pass. And we're going to hear a little bit of the original piano version of that. This has a lovely long intro. We're coming into it at about 45 seconds in. This is Samantha Edge.
one of my favorite pieces. It's really, uh, if you have a chance to listen to it all the way through, it's certainly worth it. Well, the pianist for that production of the Fantasy Negre was a young woman named Margaret Bonds. And the two of them became very close friends. Margaret's mother, Estelle, was very active in the artistic scene in Black Chicago, and she hosted poets and artists and musicians, and so that must have felt some, uh, very familiar to Florence the way that she had grown up. And eventually, the Bonds family took in Florence and her two daughters when they were going through kind of a, a rough financial patch. And Margaret later recalled uh, sitting at the kitchen table and working on orchestrations together with uh, Florence Price. And it was a reciprocal relationship because Florence taught Margaret composition and was her music mentor. So Bonds developed into a stellar composer in her own right, thanks in large part to Florence Price. And then came the biggest break yet. In 1932, Florence Price entered a prestigious contest. It was the Wanamaker Music Competition, and she won first prize for her Symphony No. 1 in E minor. And she had also entered a piano sonata, which also won a first prize, and that was in the solo instrumental category. So she came away with $750, a huge windfall, and a pretty big share of the prize money, the equivalent of over $15,000 in today's money. But just as important, her accomplishment came to the attention of Frederick Stock. He was the director of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra and he became her champion. That is him, by the way, in the photo. And I should have said Stock because he was German. So in June of 1933, Frederick Stock, had a, her Symphony No. 1 in E minor premiered at the World's Fair. This was June of 1933. And so she became the first black female to have earned that distinction. George Gershwin was in the audience. So was the diplomat Adlai Stevenson. And keep in mind, this was the all white, all male Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And Price's music received rave reviews and reporters commented on her grace and her composure and at the ovations she received. And the Chicago Daily News reported, that's the words on the bottom there, it is a faultless work, a work that speaks its own message with restraint and yet with passion, worthy of a place in the regular symphonic repertory. Well, unfortunately, her music did not get that place until very recently. And we're going to hear the opening of that symphony and listen for how skillfully she states a couple of themes right away and then she ramps up the drama. This is the first movement, the opening of that symphony number one. She's so uh, skilled. You can hear that as she states the theme and develops it and 
pulls it back and creates that drama. And we don't have time for a longer excerpt, but uh, you would hear a beautiful balance between strings and woodwinds. Uh, and again, that symphony was one that was not published until decades after she died. And there's a Wisconsin connection to that that I'll get to in just a bit. She had some momentum going after that premiere. And so her piano concerto in one movement was the next big premiere. And that took place with the Chicago Women's Symphony Orchestra in 1934. And as with this symphony, the piano concerto was not published. In fact, some of the orchestral score disappeared and the new black music repertory ensemble commissioned a composer, Trevor Weston, to work with what was left and reconstruct it. And this is a rehearsal excerpt of that piano concerto featuring Aaron Deal and the Pacific Symphony with Mei Ann Chen conducting. <laughs> piece and it's just that's just a little bit another one really worth listening to well margaret bonds was at the keyboard for that 1934 premiere and she became the chief interpreter of price's piano works margaret's mother estelle as i mentioned hosted lots of wonderful gatherings with all kinds of luminaries she called them her sunday music cows including the poet Langston Hughes. And so Bar both Margaret Bonds and Florence Price set quite a few of his poems as art songs. And Price also met the great singer Marian Anderson, and they ended up having a very close collaborative relationship. Price composed dozens of art songs and spiritual arrangements for Marian Anderson. And this photo, by the way, is of Florence Price at a gathering of the local chapter of the National Association of Negro Musicians. So I mentioned some of those art songs. That's just songs that set poetry. And we're going to hear three of those, actually two art songs and a spiritual arrangement next. And one of them is the setting of a Langston Hughes poem from 1941. This piece, her, her music dates from 1941. The Monologue for the Working Class. It's an ode to the working class, the poor, the unemployed. And she felt strongly about this one and she corresponded with Langston Hughes about it. And we'll hear baritone Justin Hopkins. There's a new wind a blowing down on Tobacco Road. There's a new hope a growing for them folks by name O Joad. There's a new truth we'll be knowing that will lift our heavy load when we find out what the working class can do. There's a new day a coming for the poor and unemployed. New tunes will be humming from our hearts so overjoyed. As we march, we'll be a drumming how our troubles been destroyed. When we find out what the working class can do. What a magnificent voice and a powerful song. We're going to hear another one. This is her setting of Langston Hughes' poetry, Song to the Dark Virgin. He called it Songs to the Dark Virgin. She used the singular. And in this case, uh, we'll hear from tenor Daryl Taylor with Maria Corley playing the piano. Would that I 
songs are so evocative, just beautiful. Well, as I mentioned, Florence Price and Marian Anderson developed a nice collaboration with Price composing over 50 pieces for Anderson. And in 1939, the DAR, the Daughters of the American Revolution, refused to allow Anderson to perform in their Constitution Hall in Washington, DC. So instead, she gave a groundbreaking performance on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial on that Easter Sunday. And thousands and thousands turned out, I think I saw 75,000 was the number of the estimate to hear that great singer. And the closing song was Price's, uh, My Soul's Been Anchored in the Lord, which apparently brought the house down, so to speak. And it's a song that Anderson went on to use as her signature piece. We're going to hear a little bit of a 1941 recording of Marian Anderson singing the song. As you probably noticed, that was not Marian Anderson singing a spiritual. That was uh, an excerpt from the violin concerto, and that was my fault. I didn't provide that clip to the director, Anthony, so I apologize for that. And if you do have time, it's one to look for if you can on your own. It's just uh, spectacular. So uh, in the 1940s, her success continued, and that included having her symphony number no. three performed by the Detroit WPA Symphony, the WPA program, the Works Progress Administration was really key for a lot of artists and musicians after the depression. And for that concert, Eleanor Roosevelt was in the audience. Also in the 40s, uh, Chicago's WGN hired her to provide music for some of their weekly broadcasts and she kept composing violin concertos and symphonies and tone poems and suites and choral and organ music and, and more. And apparently she transcribed a little bit of Bert's song. As you can see, the image in the middle there is a page from her diary. It's dated Sunday, June 5th, 1949. And she wrote, a bird now sings this phrase over and over and underneath the music, lovely day with windows open, the breeze is rather chilly. And she goes on to mention roses 
and peonies and lilies. So Florence Price's financial and physical situation started to decline and she was continually trying to find opportunities to perform and to get her music published and to get her works on the concert stage. She had heart disease and she was in and out of the hospital. And one of the letters that she wrote, she wrote letter after letter to publishers and conductors trying to get her music published or on the concert stage, as I mentioned. And this particular one was to Serge Kusevitsky. He was the longtime director of the Boston Symphony. And in this, she admits to having, quote, colored blood in her veins. She admits that she's a woman composer and she mentions being shy and she asks him to look at her music. And that last line is, will you be kind enough to examine a score of mine? She wrote to him many times over the years and didn't have any success. Every once in a while though, something would go right. And in 1950, she received a telegram from the famous English conductor, Sir John Barbaroli. And he commissioned an overture based on African-American spirituals, which she wrote, but she was too ill to travel to Europe for the premiere. But she arranged for another trip a couple of years later. It was even written up in the paper with some of her music on concert programs. But in June of 1953, just days before the trip, Florence Price died suddenly of a stroke. She was 66 years old, far, far, far too early. Some of her music continued to be performed after she died, especially by black musicians and black scholars researched and wrote about her life and music. And that LP cover of Althea Waits that we have is a recording that we do have in the WPR library, but it's in the CD form. Well, right here in Middleton, Wisconsin, AR Editions published two of her previously unpublished works, the first and third symphonies. They worked with the musicologist Ray Linda Brown, who also wrote the definitive biography about Price. She was still nowhere near a household name in the classical world though. She had been pretty marginalized as far as mainstream went, but a key thing happened to help preserve her legacy. Her daughters donated what music and papers they had to the University of Arkansas. And that university created a formal Florence Price collection. And it is a really good thing they did because in 2009, Vicki and Daryl Gatwood made an incredible discovery south of Chicago in St. Anne, Illinois. They were getting ready to renovate an abandoned house that was in awful condition hole in the roof, water had gotten in, vandals had ransacked it, and they discovered piles of handwritten music and other of her papers. And lucky for us, instead of chucking it into the dumpster, they Googled the name they kept seeing, and they discovered Florence Price, learned that the house had once belonged to her, and they found out about the collection at the University of Arkansas, and they got in touch. So two archivists from the uh, university flew to Chicago and they discovered that the treasure trove from that abandoned house contained dozens and dozens of scores that were thought to be lost, including the first and second violin concertos and quite a lot of her symphonic music. Since then, a lot of that music has been restored and edited and eventually published and finally, recorded that image in the lower right is the cover of the CD of her violin concertos that a record label sent to WPR in 2018. In fact, that year was a very good one for Price fans. The world premiere of her symphony number no. four took place and the publisher Shermer acquired the exclusive rights to her entire catalog. Well, we, when that world premiere recording of the two violin concertos arrived at the WPR library, I was just blown away by the warmth and the sophistication and the approachability and the sheer skill of the music. And we heard uh, that excerpt a little bit earlier, but maybe we, can we hear a little, maybe 30 seconds of that again? Uh, Anthony, is that possible? That would be Er Jean Kong playing the violin. Bye. 
Discovering that music sent me on a hunt for more, and I have since become a huge fan. And as you can see, she's got a pretty substantial body of work, and a lot of that is just now being recorded. It's kind of coming in in dribs and drabs, and uh, it's so much to explore and so much that we have yet to share with you as it continues to come into the library. So I think it's safe to say that the legacy of Florence Price will endure. Her music is finding its way onto concert stages and into recordings all over the place. In fact, Fran Puglio, who runs this very Badger Talks program, sent me a link a couple of weeks ago of a live digital concert of the Price Piano Concerto performed by the Philadelphia Orchestra, which she attended. She said it was fabulous. And a quick search also shows performances by the Detroit Symphony and the Lincoln Symphony and St. Louis and so many more. And that's not counting the smaller chamber groups. A couple of weeks ago on the morning show on Wisconsin Public Radio, I was asked, why is Florence Price relevant? And there are many ways to answer that question, but I will come back to that music that we started with first thing. She entitled that middle movement from Ethiopia, Shadow in America about the enslaved person's experience here, resignation and faith. She was a person of faith. She drew strength and music from the black church and she resigned herself to her situation as a brilliant composer who would rarely be taken seriously, who would always be marginalized and discriminated against. But she never let that stop her from doing exactly what she was born to do, which was to compose and perform emotionally rich and satisfying and sophisticated music. Her relevance today is that her music is finally entering its rightful place in the mainstream classical canon. It is played on mainstream radio, it's recorded on mainstream labels, and it is um, something that we're gonna hear more and more of. We must learn, I think, a lesson from all of this. She's a beacon to underrepresented composers, and we have got to encourage and be open to music by women, by blacks, by people of color, all of those who have been marginalized and underrepresented because how many more treasures are there to uncover? There is just so much more to talk about. Her life was so full and so rich and 45 minutes does not do it justice. But if you would like to do some more exploring, uh, here are a few resources, the documentary film in particular, The Caged Bird, I found really informative and well done. And the biography of, uh, of Florence Price by Ray Linda Brown was really thorough. And I have to thank my colleague, Dr. Jonathan Overby for lending that to me. And there are all kinds of articles. These are three from The New Yorker and The New York Times that I particularly enjoyed. So uh, we have some time for questions. I'm happy to answer, if I can, about Price or her music or about Wisconsin Public Radio or uh, about myself. Uh, again, many, many thanks for your interest in Florence Price and for sharing this Badger Talks live with me and each other. And thanks to Fran and the UW-Madison Badger Talks team and to WPR's Christina Myshock and also to Anthony with True Productions. And I think, um, big yes. thanks. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and Fran will be handling questions. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I, you know, you just sit here open mouth listening to this gorgeous music and how lucky we are to have found it. Don't you want to find a house where you just happen to stumble across this treasury of lost music? You hear about that happening in Europe and here as well. And it's like, I want to be that lucky, but that's phenomenal. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And oh, so many very viewers, welcome. many of your fans, I'm sure are out here watching. Um, some of the comments. So Fabu Phyllis says, I'm happy for the introduction to Florence Price from poet Fabu Willis. Oh, 
Um, Love her work. Thank you. (laughs) Steve Cabe uh, commented, Price's life story reminds me of the book, The Warmth of Other Suns, The Story of America's Great Migration by Isabel Wilkerson. Thank you for that. I I have not read that, but it's one I should put on the list, it sounds like. And Corey Copps asks, is there a place you can recommend for finding recordings of her works? Well, the newest ones are coming out now. So um, I think Albany Records has a couple. You could check their website. Uh, Otherwise, I would just use internet search and and we're relying on music coming from the labels to us. But um, I really can't point to any particular one place. Perhaps the University of Arkansas, uh, that's where her archives are and they might have a, a comprehensive Uh, list or collection of the recorded works. Great. Thank you for that. And Michaela Sullivan Fowler did comment later. I don't know about particulars relating to recordings of the musicians that Stephanie is discussing here, but the audience might like to know that the Mills Music Library at UW-Madison might be able to help with this and other music inquiries, even during COVID restrictions. And then she posted the link in the chat there for anybody who is interested. Great suggestion. The Mills Music Library is an enormous resource, a wonderful place, and they could be very helpful. Great idea. Great. And we did have uh, Tom Kaw give us a tour of Mills Music Library a couple months back on Badger Talks Live. Uh, Ruth Fitzgerald is asking, where would I find the ballet to watch and listen? Would that be out on YouTube, you think, Stephanie? Uh, it- I don't know if it's been produced since that original production. So that is a really good question. There are some still photos, but I have not seen any kind of a video and I'm not aware of any production since that one in the thirties. Okay. And do you know if published piano pieces are available? Yes. Yes, there are all kinds of her piano pieces. And uh, yeah, that was something I was thinking about as I was putting this together, you know, it'd be great to order some of her music and work. Although, well, she has some for beginners and she has some for intermediates and boy, you better be a pretty advanced player to tackle some of those other ones. (laughs) Yeah, you can tell she was definitely a a pianist and an organist too. So you're saying that there is some repertoire for organ that she wrote as well, huh? Yep. Yep. In fact, I was reading that when she was at the conservatory, the New England Conservatory, one of the classes that she had required her to take, they worked with an orchestra and choir sometimes, and she had to learn how to take the the orchestra parts and the choir parts and reduce it all at once in her head on the organ while she was uh, looking at the music. I can't imagine. Wow. Wow. Genius level there. Yeah. Uh, Claudette Herring says, wonderfully informative. Florence was such a bright, talented, and determined woman. Great that you are sharing her works with us. Uh, Thank you. Catherine, oh, that we answered her. She was asking about the cotton in the land of cotton piece. So we did post that also out in the chat. Uh, Jane Jamula says, yes, I was waiting for Marian Anderson to cross paths with Price. So she posted that when you introduced Marian into, into the story. Uh, let's see, Nancy McCaskey's asking, could you provide a list of the recordings you used in your presentation? I'm sure I'm not the only one who wants to hear more. So could we post that, Stephanie, in the, I'll oh. post that in the chat after, after the event is over? You bet. Great. Thank you. You bet. Uh, let's see. Every day with a little Elkins is made a bit brighter, says Lynn Somers. This wonderful and informative presentation of Florence Price. Amazing and a great honor to her talents. Emily Wilson then says, thank you for this excellent program. I first heard of Price through your WPR programs. I recently played two of her short piano works at my church. Clarnon publisher gave me permission to play them. Oh, I'm thrilled to hear that. Thank you. Okay. See, all the people here are inspiring. Yeah. Uh, Let's see. I had a real quick question for you, Stephanie. So not only was Florence obviously a Black person in in a white person's world at the time, but obviously a woman too. Where did she land in the spectrum of women being performed by 
you know, not just major orchestras, but even chamber groups and whatnot. Where did she land in that spectrum? Yeah, it was pretty rare for that time. Um, she was lucky that she ended up at the at the New England Conservatory because Boston was a little bit progressive in that way. They were um, playing music by Amy Beach, who was a prominent American composer, and she was she was white. But um, Chicago also was was progressive, and Frederick Stock was was quite progressive. But most of the other organizations and orchestras and even chamber groups really didn't feel that women's music had a place on the, in the serious classical mm -hmm. world, which mm -hmm. is, is such a shame. So, so she's, um, she was one of the few to rise in prominence. There were a handful, but she was one of the few. Excellent. Well, Stephanie, thank you so much for sharing this gorgeous music and shining your light on all of us today. It was just phenomenal. I, I, you can't not listen to this music and be impacted and just feel a warmth in your soul. It's just pure America. So thank you so much. Thank you, Fran. And thanks for the opportunity to, to share. Our pleasure. We're glad to have you. So please join us next Tuesday, March 9th at noon. Uh, we'll be featuring Tessa Conroy, who is an assistant professor of agriculture and applied economics. She's gonna be talking about broadband internet and the Wisconsin economy. And uh, access to broadband is really limited in many Wisconsin communities. So she's gonna be talking about how UW Extension is currently doing work in this area and how that impacts you. Please visit badgertalks.wisc.edu where you can see the upcoming schedule of talks. You can sign up for our email list, consider making a donation to future free programming. And you can also request a speaker for your own upcoming event. We take talk requests, uh, about 200 of them a year. So if you're hosting an event and you'd like to have a UW speaker featured, you can request that on our website. Thanks so much for tuning in everybody. We'll see you next week.